All right. So I hope you I hope you enjoyed a few of those facts. Maybe something you did not know about UCLA. Um, you are part of the one of the top five uh, alumni uh, groups of all American universities with over 540,000 uh, living alumni. So uh, that's just one of many facts um, from the Nobel Prize winners to to firsts in society and science and the arts. So I hope that was fun. Uh, welcome one and welcome all. I'm Dylan Stafford. Hopefully uh, many of you were here last time, but if you were not, welcome to Leadership Lab number two. Uh, I think uh, people are still, uh, everything is awesome. Yes, Pooja. <laughs> oh yeah, we should do a whole, we should do a whole breakout. I mean, a whole word cloud about favorite songs. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I'm broadcasting from my in-laws home in North Carolina. We're on vacation this week. Um, schedule's got a little uh, convoluted this summer with my children and their school, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but with you all tonight. Um, so welcome to Leadership Lab number two on behalf of eight programs from six different UCLA graduate programs that you see listed across the bottom. The Anderson School of Management, the David Geffen School of Medicine, the Fielding School of Public Health, the Luskin School of Public Affairs, the School of Dentistry, the School of Nursing. Um, yeah, thanks. Before we go to, let me just stay here for just a second. In leadership lab number one, we discovered the power of context, that a leader can use language to create a context that addresses the concerns of the relevant parties. And uh, we're gonna, in a little while, we're gonna hear from a couple of you because we'd love to hear what you discovered for yourself with the bonus assignment, those of you who chose to do it. My context, I said this a little last lab, my context is that you all gathered here tonight, you are the future, you are the, people who will create the society that my children grow up in. You will be the people who solve the next pandemic before it happens. You are the folks who get to build the society that's a more inclusive, a more just society that has space for everyone. And that's the context that has me happily be here with you in the middle of my vacation. We want you to win. Our commitment, the team that you're gonna meet on the next slide, all of us representing eight different graduate programs and eight really wonderful graduate programs of the over 125 graduate programs at UCLA. We're just a small subset, but we're a powerful subset. And you all, the students of our programs, we want you to have the best academic term ever. And we know you're already academic standouts or you would not have earned your seat. So we know we have a high bar to clear, but our commitment is that if we can offer you something in these three leadership labs that just raises the trajectory of your first fall semester, fall quarter, whichever program size you're in, you know, probably for most of you a, a quarter, if we can raise your trajectory one degree, you know, over a lifetime, that one degree raising of your trajectory makes a huge difference. We want you to be graduates of UCLA two, three, four, and five years from now in your respective programs. And we want you to be leaders of our state, of our nation, and, and of the world. So that's my context, and I'm thrilled that we're here tonight. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is our interdisciplinary team. Not everyone can be here tonight, so uh, we're going to have words of welcome from as many of us as are here. We had a couple people with um, family connections and conflicts, uh, but we're all here in spirit. So with no further ado, if I could begin on the top left with Elisa from the David Geffen School of Medicine. Thank you so much, Dylan, and warm welcome to everyone who can be here with us this evening. So glad so many of you could make it to Leadership Lab 2. I'm Elisa Lopez with the David Geffen School of Medicine and uh, wanna wish our medical students uh, a warm welcome as well. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa, and welcome medicine. Elisa. Uh, where I saw you a minute ago. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Elisa Turkwitz, and I represent the Masters of Financial Engineering program at Anderson School of Management. So I work or liaise with Dylan, and I can speak firsthand about the passion that he brings to this topic and to his students. And I also would like to give a special welcome to all of our incoming MFE, as well as everyone else that was able to join tonight. Thank you so much, Alisa. I believe Anna may or may not have been able to, she had, 
child care end of day arrangements. Okay, I don't think she's she's going to join us a little later. So uh, she, on behalf of Anna Guzman, Director of Student Services from the School of Dentistry, we welcome all of our incoming dentistry students. Um, Liz Izquierdo. Thanks, Dylan. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Izquierdo. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs for the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And we're so happy that you all are here again with us this evening. I know last time it was a great discussion and today um, will be the same. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Liz. Um, Mark, I'm not sure we saw Mark in the green room. Did Mark, was Mark able to join? Okay, well, on behalf of uh, Mark Coven, Director of Admissions and Recruitment for the School of Nursing, we appreciate all of the nurses who are with us this evening. I got to speak with a couple of you at the end of Leadership Lab One, and we're thrilled to have you here. This is the first year that we get to have you with us. Thank you very much. Oliver. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Oliver E.K. I'm the Associate Director for Admissions and Recruitment for the Department of Social Welfare uh, in the school, the Luskin School of Public Affairs. My pronouns are he, him. Um, again, welcome, a special shout out to all the uh, incoming MSW students. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for actually having your cameras on. It's always great to see everyone. I know everyone has Zoom fatigue uh, very, very bad right now, but it's always great to see everyone's face. So thank you all for having your cameras on and welcome. Thank you, Oliver. Yes, dentistry, nursing, and public affairs are, are joining us this year. Uh, the other programs were here last year, so we're really thrilled to have, have you all adding your presence to our chorus of voices. Sarika. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarika Thack. I'm the Executive Director of Admissions for the Executive MBA program at Anderson. So happy to see uh, so many people from all different parts of campus. It's really an exciting uh, event that we're having today, Leadership Lab number two, and excited that uh, we all could be here together. Thank you, Sarika. And I don't believe Gonzalo was able to join, but I could be wrong because I can't see everyone. So those of you who were here last time, you got to meet uh, Gonzalo Frasius. He's the, he's my, I report to him. He's the Associate Dean of the Executive MBA and the Fully Employed MBA program. So Sarek and I have the pleasure of working with Gonzalo and he's really been a patron of this project for the last three years um, as we have continued to evolve. And, uh, and so on behalf of Gonzalo, welcome to UCLA. All right, the next slide. Let me say some words for those of you who weren't here last time. Dr. Kush Cooper and I will lead tonight's um, conversation. It's really a, an inquiry. And uh, Dr. Kush Cooper is adjunct professor in the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. She is a incredible human being, in my opinion, social entrepreneur and consultant. Uh, her focus is child welfare systems, both public and private. Uh, specifically, uh, she spends a tremendous amount of, of advocacy um, in the foster care reform effort that we can make our foster care system work uh, better for more people uh, across the spectrum of, of participants in that, uh, specifically LGBTQ youth, but, but all the, the, the young people in our foster care um, system. So she's a tireless advocate, spends uh, lots of time in Sacramento, as well as uh, teaching and, and researching here at UCLA. She's also an expert in implementation science and leadership. And just to say, I forgot to say this last time, she's tonight in all three labs are pro bono. They're a, they're a, um, they're a gift from, from Dr. Cooper to us. Um, the material that you will hear tonight is from her course, Social Welfare 270. Um, it's just a tiny extract of a much bigger course. But um, Kush, my compatriot and my sister from another mister, uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here. Dylan, it's a pleasure to partner with you on this. Yes, Oliver's clapping his hands. We are all, we love the magic that you bring. So thank you, Kush. And thank this you. is a, an appreciated uh, contribution of your faculty time. So thank you. I'm Dylan Stafford. I'm an assistant dean at UCLA Anderson with a fully employed MBA program. In my 19th year at UCLA, I'm an accidental university administrator. Never uh, thought I would be doing this, but I followed my fiance, who's my forever wife, to Los Angeles with her career 
19, 20 years ago, and I just couldn't be happier to get to work with amazing people like all of us here tonight. So, um, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so what we're going to cover, um, you know, this is a three-part leadership lab. So just to, and as I said, it's based on on Dr. Cooper Cush's course, Social Welfare 270. Um, what we will cover tonight um, is the is session two, the four foundational factors for being a leader, integrity, authenticity, um, being given, being in action by something bigger than yourself. I know that's a, a big, long phrase, but it, it really is. Leaders, leaders choose what they lead and they choose specifically and they it's not an accident. They look at the landscape and they they pick the area where they want to make a difference. And they're they're given being by that. They're they're called forth by that. It informs how they interact, how they be, how they speak, how they lead. So that's the third of the four. And and the fourth of the four is being cause in the matter. Another way to say that is radical accountability. So tonight we're gonna we're gonna delve deeper into all of these. Um, last session, session number one, the power of context. Just to do a quick review, we we looked at the question of what makes extraordinary leaders, if you'll recall, and we asked the question: Well, are they are they born that way? Do they have better genetics? Are they just naturally more charismatic? Are they able to speak in public? You know, is 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 it is Obama is President Obama or pick pick the leader that we spoke of last time, Nelson Mandela? Are these people just you know do they have better genes than me? Probably. But also maybe what makes extraordinary leaders is, is not that they're born that way. Remember the word cloud that we did with all the different attributes of leaders. Maybe it's how they see. Maybe they are actually ordinary people like you and me, but how they see the world, they see the world differently. And we, we went from there to living, to looking at two different ways of looking at life. So we looked at two different ways of being in the world last time. We looked at on the court versus in the stands. So on the court, a first person as lived, real time, moment to moment experience of life contrasted with an in the stands, stepping back, observing others, having opinions and concepts and theories of. So we looked at living life on the court versus in the stands. We looked at the power of context that a leader actually has the ability and consciously engages in creating a context for what they are up to in life and an empowering context that empowers them and everyone around them. And lastly, we looked at, which is in the title of our leadership lab, leadership begins with leading yourself. And I invite you to just, just be proud of yourself. You're at this, you're at this tremendous starting point of this journey of discovery in all eight disciplines represented tonight, medicine, public health, nursing, social welfare, management, financial engineering, nursing, the people that you will touch will be led by you. When you graduate UCLA and you commence across the stage and you commence into your future, you will be a graduate of UCLA. People will listen to you as a leader. And that could be intimidating, but that's two, three, four, five years from now. Right now, leadership begins with leading yourself. Or as we said in, in our banner from Coach Wooden, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. That our commitment in these labs is to jumpstart your graduate study. First, I get my own house in order. And as I establish mastery in my own domain, in my own life, as I become a leader, a CEO of my CEO of my world, I develop the capacity to, to be a leader of others. So um, that was a quick review from session one, a little look ahead to what we're gonna cover tonight. So next slide, please. So as we said, the, the material tonight is based on the full course that uh, that Dr. Kush Cooper teaches, Social Welfare, Social Welfare 270. Um, the formal name of the course, and I will say this slowly because it's a mouthful, the formal name of the course is Being a Leader in the Effective Exercise of Leadership, an Ontological 
phenomenological model. So uh, those are a couple $15 words and I'll say more about them. The, one of the unique things about this course is that it employs a slide deck textbook. So in contrasted to many of the courses we're familiar with, in this course, the material is actually presented as you will see it tonight in a, in a consecutive series of PowerPoint slides where you as a course participant actually get to read the material as it is being presented. And one of the things that that provides is a different access to the material. If you've ever noticed, you can be looking down, taking notes or typing on your laptop, taking notes and get just a tiny bit distracted. <laughs> if you've ever had that experience, this course with this pedagogy has a, has a different ability to offer you access to the, the goal of the course, which is being a leader and exercising leadership effectively as your natural self-expression. So lastly, the two $15 words, ontological, ontological. Ontological is the study of being. Biology is the study of, you know, organisms. You know, we have all of the ologies. This is a word we don't typically use so often, ontology, and it's the study of being. Ology is the study of, onto is being. And if you ever noticed, we as a species are human beings, right? We don't have if you have a pet, you don't have a dog being or a cat being. I know some people may argue with me on that, but we are the species that has this appendage. We have the second word, being. So ontological refers to the study of being. And phenomenological is the method one employs to study ontology. So phenomenology is phenomena, that which happens, that which can be observed as lived first person experience on the court. So tonight's um, session is, a, is an excerpt from a much larger course. Next slide, please. So how to listen tonight. Try things on that you hear tonight the way you would try on a jacket in a store, right? Put on the jacket, you're in the three-way mirror, you're looking at the cut, does this, you know, does this bring out my complexion? Do I like the way this makes me shine and shimmer? Do I like where the pocket is located? I'm trying it on like something I might like, I might wear, I might take out into the world or something I might take off and put back on the rack. I'm not married to it either way. So try things on tonight like a jacket. This course will arise dissonance. This will arise cognitive dissonance. We will say things tonight in a way that you may not have heard before. That's okay. That's how we will provide access to this start of your journey of leadership. It's okay if there's some dissonance tonight. Embrace it, even pull it towards you. Pull the conversation towards you. What could I see? What could I discover for myself here on June 16th at the outset of my UCLA graduate journey? This is not TV. This is a chance for you to actually discover and participate. And don't believe anything that we say tonight. There's, this is not the truth about leadership. This is a well-built course, but it's more of a guide for your discovery than it is a list of things for you to remember. Look in your life tonight with an eye to discover for yourself. Wow, they're suggesting that I could be a leader when I graduate UCLA. I didn't even think about that. I just wanted to be the best doctor I could be. I just wanted to be the best nurse I could be. I wasn't thinking about being a leader of other doctors or a leader of other nurses. But when you think about it, that's the journey you're on. You're going to be a master of your discipline. When you graduate at the end of your time at UCLA, you will have mastery in your discipline. You will be used by the education that you're going to so rigorously engage with in these upcoming years. And the Education using you out in the world will have you be a person that people naturally look up to, listen to, and, and want to be led by. Next slide, please. So session two, that's what we're up to tonight, the four foundational factors. And we're going to just check in a little bit on session one. I do want to hear from some people. Um, 
let's see what we covered in session one. Yeah, I think we can we can move on through that one. What I wanted to look at just by way of review from session one before we get into the four foundational factors is that the context is decisive. The lens that we have, how we see life as a leader governs how we be and how we act. And what we looked at last time was the default context is the automatic context that just arises. It just arises. I don't have to think about it. I walk in the room, I look around, oh, he's here. Oh, it's gonna be a bad meeting. That's a default context. That's a, a context that I didn't have any say over. And that context is gonna be decisive. Oh, he's here. That's gonna be a long meeting. He's gonna ask me for stuff I don't have. He's probably gonna talk about golf. That's a default context. A created context is what leaders create. So my context with you all tonight, you are the people that will build the society that my children get to live in. That's a created context. That's me using language to create a world that wasn't gonna get created elsewise, right? The default context could have been, oh, I'm on vacation. I wish we hadn't had to da 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 da. How can I do this from my in-laws living room? That's an automatic context, but leaders create a context. I'm here with 150 to 250 leaders from around the world who are all coming together to UCLA in eight incredible disciplines to build the future that my children get to grow up and live in. So the context is decisive. So if we can go to the next slide, we're gonna do a little bit of interaction now and Kush will join me. So last time at the end of Leadership Lab number one, we posed this question. When does your UCLA degree begin? And for those of you who weren't here, we, we looked, yes, Pooja, thank you. We looked at, well, the default context would be for my fully employed MBA students, August 30th. We begin on the first day of orientation, of course, right? That's just the automatic. I don't have to think about it. But if we could advance the slide, but notice what shifts if you create the context that your UCLA degree begins now. Or even, thank you for the ideas in the chat. Yeah, two years ago when I started preparing with full, with full focus, when I, when I actually hit submit on my application, when I paid my intent to register fee, there can be lots of starting points well before day one of orientation. And our invitation at the end of Leadership Lab number one, the bonus assignment was to go into your life for the two weeks from June 2nd to tonight, June 16th, and look when I began my GMAT prep, yes, <laughs> or, or uh, GRE or MCAT or any of the other exams that we, that we jumped through. So I'd love to hear from one or two of you who, um, who were here in Leadership Lab number one, who took this on. Um, just use the little raise hand function and I'll call on a couple people. But um, Kush and I would love to hear from a couple of you. What did you see? What did you discover by creating a context that graduate school has already begun? Who would like to be brave and go first? All right, Maggie. Yes, if you could come off mute, we would love to hear. What did you discover for yourself? Um, I think for me, just, um, you know, after I applied, I just felt this sense of relief. And um, it, it was right around the time that I had finished undergrad. And so I just wanted to be lazy and do nothing for the first time in, you know, four years. And um, once I created the context for myself just in the last two weeks that my degree has already started, my UCLA degree has already begun. I thought, oh man, I need to get, I need to get some stuff together. You know, I have to create a home office and I have to, um, you know, get some things in my life organized that I've really been putting off, take care of my health. Just really, it motivated me to, to take charge and kind of lead myself uh, in the direction with that mindset that, hey, it's already started, you know. Fantastic. And, and you can still be lazy. <laughs> yeah. we're, not, we're not taking away the ability to be lazy. And in the context of 
wow, it's begun. Okay, I have a home office to attend to. I have my, my health and well being, right? Like graduate school is going to take long hours. So, okay, what about my nutrition? What, yeah, so what, what other things were you discovering there would be to attend to? Um, I think those were the main things. Um, but even just my mindset and, um, I started noticing that like at work, I kind of shifted the way, like the words I would use, the way I would talk about myself, because before it was, I hope to, you know, get admission into UCLA. I hope to get my MBA, but then I, I started kind of shifting my words. It's almost like when you believe something into existence or you, you know, you speak it into existence, that kind of thing. Um, but here it is, it's happening. And so now my language changed. Um, and even I, I have noticed since I've been admitted, uh, the way I am treated at work has changed a little bit too. So that's been interesting. That's because the context is decisive for them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really brilliant, Maggie. Really brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, and thank you for going first. And I mean, and it's, it's literally like the con this context, default context gone. Okay. Now created context in. Oh, I, I see. Def I, was that there the whole time? The thing I didn't see with the default context? Yes. It was there the whole time. Right. And that's how context works. So you don't even see certain things, but then you can see them once you shift context and leaders are masters of context. Really great, Maggie, thank you. All right, Sabik. Hi everyone, uh, great to be here. Um, uh, I think since I, I got uh, accepted and, and also kind of signed on the dotted line, uh, one thing that I have noticed is uh, anything new that has been coming up at work. Uh, for example, I was just asked if I could start on a new project, right? Uh, would be in line with already stuff that I'm doing. So you kind of have to think at that point, will you have the bandwidth in three months time? Uh, and, you know, some of these things could be done completed in three months, but again, you don't know. So you have to kind of take that into context as well before committing to that at this point, right? Uh, because I was thinking like first thing I said to my boss as well is I don't want to set myself up for failure come September when I'm you know I'm going to have one less Friday to kind of work on or full Friday um, and then I have coursework as well and she's been very supportive about those kind of things but so you know taking that into account uh, 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 you know even though we're we're not really starting school till September we're start, you know, still starting to think about it now. Uh, and not just at work, but at home as well. If there are things coming up. A cousin's getting married. I sent him my calendar saying, not on these weekends. You're not. <laughs> if you want me to attend. Uh, I agree. So uh, things like that. I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, keeping things in perspective. Uh, just because classes start in, in three months doesn't mean you can't, you don't plan for it now. Thank you, Sam. Really great. And you know the, the this matter of you, you 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 you're pointing at something. Well, it really hasn't started now. I think I I, I think where the where the words you used and there's this there's this interesting thing about really, right? Um, we we're we're brought up in sort of the scientific uh, conversation around third person verifiable. Well, it's real then. Right, it's real if it's verifiable and science has proved it's real. Um, so if I can verify it, it's real. However, what about what about the pain in your foot? I can't verify you have a pain in your foot unless you tell me. So is the pain in your foot real? Absolutely. Right, and so this like. What's real and what's not real, right? Um, it, it isn't necessarily what we think. And you, what you say, right? About like, well, it starts now. That's just as real as the scientific version of it. Right? Yeah, great. We have time for one more. Yeah. All right, Samantha. 
Hi. Um, so I felt similarly where it was like, oh, I have to get all of these things together. Like I have to get an iPad and I have to, you know, make sure I have whatever. But then it also reached a level of um, a lot of things are going to be changing and not just within myself and, and my career and my life, but also with my relationships with other people. And so I've started to like make sure that my dog is ready to be home alone for three hours every night and um, communicate with my friends that I'm going to have less time to spend with them and sort of beginning to set those boundaries with friends and family now. Um, and I started drinking out of my Anderson mug and like, yeah, I feel like I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so great. And, and, and to think, you know, Samantha, if you can do that, if you can do that with graduate school, right? Like shift the context and have different results, right? That, imagine what else you could do that with. Definitely. Yeah. Right? Like, like Dylan was saying, that really annoying person that was in the meeting that he, right? Like he, he has the, he's the one that's suffering <laughs> or, with, with the context he has, not the person, right? So he could, could create another, a, a different, more empowering context and it wouldn't suffer. It's a lot of the suffering that we take on is optional. It is pretty amazing. Like the, the profound change that happens almost immediately. No, yeah. it is. And the circumstances for everyone, the circumstances in none of these three, so Maggie and Sabek and Samantha, thank you. The circumstances aren't different. Still have the same people around. My dog is the same dog. Right. <laughs> my family's the same family. My boss is the same boss, but there's a new language. My graduate school, there's, you know, there, there's a, it, how I be and how I act is impacted inside of this new context that I created. I created it. I chose to try on some new words. I, I tried on a new jacket. Let's do this bonus assignment. I'm, gonna, I'm going to stand in. My graduate degree has begun and I'm going to see what arises as a natural self-expression. So it's, it, is, it is powerful. The circumstances are, are they're the same. And yet there's, there's an experience of living available new and beyond what the other context, the default context, I should say, made available. Yeah. And, and, you know, Dylan, you know, I don't want to, I don't want folks to sort of walk away with this notion that, well, you know, now, you know, like all there is to do in situations that are, that, that I don't like or are uncomfortable to me is, is shift the context. There are some situations in which you should structurally leave, <laughs> right? There are structural solutions, right, for certain situations. So there, it, 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 it's 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 sort of knowing which tool to use when, right? Um, I, I you know if if someone is about to hurt you, I don't need you to develop an empowering context <laughs> about that. I need you to run, right? Uh, yeah. Thank you. For sure. All right. So shall we keep going? Yes. Let's look at the All four right. fundamentals. Let's look at the four fundamentals. All right. Go ahead, Dylan. So there, to have a solid foundation for anything, right, you need to think about what, what is it upon which everything else will be built. And in, in this inquiry into what makes for an effective leader, the solid foundation is, is we've distinguished is built on four factors, four foundational factors. Without these four, even if you have the title of leader, you're the head of the department, you got promoted to be head of the department. So now you have the title, you have the role of leader. You may even have the authority and decision rights, but you can forget about actually being a leader and exercising leadership effectively without these four foundational factors. So let's uh, advance them and show. So number one, being a person of integrity. And here we're talking about, oh, okay. All right, okay, I'm gonna- You can just click them all up, click them okay. all on, Jill. Yeah, so being a person of integrity. Thank you, Jill. Being authentic. 
being given being and action by something bigger than oneself and being cause in the matter. So these are the four areas, the four foundational factors that we will discover tonight. That when mastered, these four found four factors form the foundation for being a leader and exercising leadership effectively. So let's say a little bit more about mastery. A word on mastery. For most of you here tonight, you will earn a master's degree. Some of you will actually earn a doctorate at the time that your UCLA graduate study completes. If you're a doctorate, you have moved through mastery to an even higher level where you actually can create knowledge. But for all of us, we will become masters in the eight different fields tonight. And a master is someone who doesn't remember what they learned, but they are used by what they learned. They have learned it at the level that is become who they are. It's become a part of their natural self-expression. So the example for medicine, you can earn the degree and you are a doctor of medicine, but you still will go into your further study, your residency, and you will practice medicine. And it may not always happen at the moment that the degree is conferred. That may not be the moment that you look in the mirror and you see looking back at you, the doctor that you've become. It could happen that way same moment, but it might happen before, it might happen after. But there's a difference between knowing what there is to know to be a medical doctor and actually being a medical doctor. The bedside manner case is the most often cited case. You can be the smartest doctor in your graduating class and you can walk into the room with the patient and what the patient may need from you is not your best in class scientific wisdom. What the moment may require is something entirely from a different domain. It may require your empathy, your presence, your humanity. Your science may take a back seat to your humanity in the front seat because that's what's required and you don't even think about it. You be that because you are used by, you are given by the distinctions of the world of medicine. Or another way to look at it would be in the world of dance. You learn the moves of a dance and you practice those moves and it's clunky. Then as you get better, you learn the choreography and it starts to come together. And if you discipline yourself for years and you become a dancer, then it's effortless. The music arises, the lights come on, and you're dancing, and who you be is a dancer. And you no longer think about the steps or the choreography. You be a dancer in the world. Leadership is very much like dance. It happens on the court, in the moment, with the people and the environment. And I don't always get to choose the song, and I don't always get to choose the lights, and I don't even get to choose my dance partner many, many times. And if I be a leader in life, I have what it takes authentically as my natural self-expression to dance with the moment as the moment arises. We go to the next slide. So our four foundational factors, being a person of integrity, being authentic, being given, being in action by something bigger than oneself, being cause in a matter, when mastered, these four factors form the foundation for being a leader in the effective exercise of leadership. Okay, so let's look at being a person of integrity. If we could go to the next slide, we'll look at what is integrity for a person. So we say it's a matter of one's word, nothing more and nothing less. And the degree to which that word is whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition, the degree to which my word can be counted on is the degree to which my integrity 
is in with the people in my life. So being a person of integrity is the first of the four foundational factors for being a leader. And we're speaking of integrity more the way engineers would talk about the integrity of a bridge. An engineer would look at a bridge and they would address integrity by asking, is the bridge capable of doing what it is designed to do? Can it bear the load? Can it withstand the weather conditions? Is it whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition for doing what it's designed to do? So if you have a part in your car that is no longer in integrity, well, that part in your engine no longer can turn the way it's designed to turn, which then impacts the ability of your engine to produce the power it's designed to produce, which impacts the ability of your car to move the way it's designed to move, which impacts your ability to get to work or get to a date or get to where you're going in life. For your car to function, the components of the engine have to function the way they are designed to function. So when we look at word for a human being, specifically for a person in a leadership position, what are we looking at? So we define one's word as having six components. The first is the obvious one, what you said you would do. So giving your word to someone communicates that you will do what you said you would do by the time you said you would do it. Or if you're not going to do what you said you would do, you have communicated to the other person that you will not be doing what you said you would do and you would clean up any mess that was caused by that. So the first component of being my word is doing what I said I would do, pretty obvious. The second component of being my word is what you know to do. So this is doing whole and complete work even if not specifically requested. So there's doing what I said I would do, but when my integrity is fully in, I'm not doing just the bare minimum. I only said I would do X. I'm doing what I know there is to do to have the situation function and work for the people involved. The third element of my word is what is expected of me. And this includes unexpressed requests of me by all those with whom I wish to have a workable relationship. So myself, I am a happily married husband and father of two children. The three most important people in my life, my wife and my two children, they have expectations of me as the husband, as the dad. And they're, even when they're unexpressed, their requests of me are part of my word. It's what I signed up for, being in a marriage and being a parent. So I don't get to say, well, just because you want it, I didn't say I would explicitly do that. No, there's a way I be as a husband, there's a way I be as a father that is out of their expectations of me. Now the reverse does not hold. <laughs> my unexpressed ex my unexpressed requests of my wife are not part of her word to me unless I explicitly make them express. And it doesn't seem fair, does it? It's just not fair. But if you look, if you look, pick an important person in your life, your sister, your brother, your mother, your father, your best friend, right? When their birthday comes around, Whose job is it to remember that their birthday's coming around? Right? Now, did you sign a contract with your best friend that I will always remember your birthday? No, it's an unexpressed request, but part of what comes along with being a best friend is being there for my best friend on the days that are most important for my best friend. So it's an unexpressed request, but if I am committed to having a workable relationship with people in my life, I begin to pay attention to those. So number four is 
what I say is so. So if I make an assertion into the world about a topic, I'm giving my word that another person could look at what it is that has me make an assertion and they would see that my what, how, the, the evidence and the perspective that had me come to that assertion, they could see that they could, they might not agree with it, but they could definitely see where it comes from. And they could see that I am, my word, what I say is so, is, is present. So number five is what I say I stand for, what you say you stand for. So if you say you are for world peace, and then you walk through life having arguments with everyone, people might look at that and they might ask themselves, is that person really for peace or is that something they say, but they don't practice? So when I am being what I say I stand for, there's an alignment between what I say and who I be and how I act and how I carry myself. And number six, the last of the six, is moral, ethical, and legal standards of the groups of which I enjoy membership. So how many of you know that when you got your driver's license, you gave your word not to speed? What? I never said I wouldn't speed. No, no, it's actually, you know, we actually agree. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Um, we actually agree to obey the posted speed when we receive our driver's license. So one group I wish to be a member of is the group of people who have a valid driver's license. And part of what my word is, is that I will follow the posted signs. Now, do I always do that? No. But my word is that with the receipt of this driver's license, I will participate in the posted rules in the different cities and streets and highways on which I drive. Okay, so we're about to go to our first breakout. We're gonna follow. Um, so, and Dylan, I do, I just, I do wanna um, please just see if folks have questions, right? Like, do you have, do you have questions? Any yeah, buts, how about and what ifs, you know, because if you're anything like me, when when I saw this slide initially, right, number one, that was OK. Then number two showed up and I kind of went, ooh. then number three. And by the time we got to number four or number five or number six, I was pretty much convinced that, you know, I'm not a person of integrity. Newsflash, you're not. I'm not. Right. Um, you can never be in 100 percent integrity all the time, unless all you've said you're up to in life is uh, laying on the couch and eating potato chips for eight hours a day. OK, you, you just don't need a whole bunch of a whole bunch of integrity for that. Right? The so this driving the driver's license business, right? Like now. Now what? Oh, no, you speed. You're out of integrity. You're not a leader, right? And you're a bad person. You're not full, right? Like, okay. So that's not how it works. With, with integrity, it's cumulative, right? So um, just imagine that every time, right? You're, you're, you're out of integrity, right? Out of, out of integrity, one of these aspects of your word, you lose a finger. Take it like that. Okay. I'm speeding. Okay. I can still write. I can still type. I can I have fully full functionality in my hand. Okay. I didn't call my mom on her birthday. Oh boy. All right. So now I got three. I'm still all right. I'm still all right. Right. But as it starts to add up your power and your ability to perform diminishes, right? And if you're up to big things, 
you need all the power you can get, right? And so that's really how to hold this. It isn't like, well, screw it. Now I'm like, I'm out of integrity. I speed. It's not how I want you to hold it. No. So questions. It's clear. Okay. All right. I do have a question. Like, sure. what would be a good example of what you say is so? Um, I say that between um, 20 and 60% of runaway and homeless youth are LGBTQ. That's what I say is so. Now, you should be able to go look that up and it'd be so. So there's an example. Thank you. Right. And is anybody, if I said that a conference presentation, if I got that wrong, could anybody really tell? Probably not, right? But I know, mm. right? I know, I know, I know. And it impacts the context of being out of integrity impacts who you be. You know how you are when you're late to class? Right? Like all of a sudden you become, you want to be invisible, right? Oh no, I'm late. I'm going to slink in. I'm going to sit in the corner. I'm going to hope nobody noticed. Or, if, you know, if you're like me, I'm going to contribute extra to make up for it, right? Context is decisive. Yep. So being out of integrity has you do weird things. Other questions? I do have a question on number two, what do you know to do? How do you mm -hmm. balance that with like being a perfectionist and not delivering more than it's necessary and managing your time? Um, okay, so, so, so I, something that will serve you in our interactions together, and this is, not, this is, this is for all of you, um, is let, let's, look at a, let, let's look at a real scenario, right? So let, and, and we can make one up. It, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly reality, but so, so you're saying that there's a scenario where you're, you're, you've been given something to do. Is that, would that be accurate? You've been given something to do, and now you're going to, you're doing beyond what's asked of you. Is that, do I have that right? Is that the scenario? Yeah, it just it's just going over and over without actually solving the, the problem because you always think it can get a little better or maybe you have way too many details that you think should be resolved and you'll never get to an MVP point. Uh, so here's, so in that situation, this is how I, how I hold it, right? Look, you know you're a perfectionist. You know that doesn't work, right? So what you know to do is to tell people that you are and have them support you not to be, <laughs> right? Like, like so it, it's, it's, we can overthink it sometimes, but it's, it's more, there's nothing wrong with you being a perfectionist. There's nothing right with it, it's just how you are. You know, I like red, You're, you know, you like perfectionism, but what you, that's the, what, the, what you know to do part is to deal with your perfectionism. That's how I'd answer the question. Does, does that help or did it make it worse? No, it does help, thank you. Okay, good. all right. Okay, Dylan. Well, I, you know, I just, I love Julia's question. You know, <laughs> It's a dance, right? Um, you know, what about answering every email? <laughs> you know, like I love, and, and what I love about the art of management is that it's, it's just, it's never, you know, it's never all handled, right? That's, that's what we, you know, managers live in shades of gray. And sometimes we, you know, we say stuff like, you know, like sometimes good enough is good enough. So, you know, and that's, and that's the challenge of leadership I would even offer also that the further I go in life, the more there are 
legitimate large demands upon my time, right? I'm committed to be an active parent. I want my children to have present parents. That takes time. I'm committed to playing a big game in my career. That takes time. I want to have a philanthropic pro bono part of my life. I want to sit on boards. I want to make a difference. That takes time. So there's a, it's, it's not pixie dust, <laughs> you know, it's not about perfection. And when I'm dancing out here with people in my life, there is that partnership available where I can even save me from myself because <laughs> I'll go so deep on this. You know, my wife and I, my wife manages a career while I manage a career while we manage being parents and it's right. But, it, but, but out here in communication, you know, we, we even, we even help each other establish when, when, what I know to do is, is present. Like, that's good. My wife will tell me sometimes you can stop now. <laughs> like she helps me not go too far down a rabbit hole. So if, um, so we're going to send uh, Aaron on my team has got the, the room set up on our team. Aaron, thank you so much. If you want to grab your phone and just take a picture of these six elements, because we're going to, we're going to send you into your random breakout groups and uh, you're going to, you know, please, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, what program are you going into? Um, anything you'd like to say just to, to be known. We will, um, why don't we go alpha by first name? So alpha by first name, if your name starts with A, you'll go before someone whose name starts with B and we'll go once around the room. Um, whoever's got the last whoever's name will come last, let that person be the timer, okay? And just make sure that everybody gets to share. So how long should we send them into the room for, Koosh? I think 10, min 10, 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. 10 minutes is good, yep. So so we'll send you, uh, Aaron, I think we're in groups of four or five. If that's, is that right, Aaron? Yes, that's correct. Should we do a smaller room since everyone needs to go? Intros can take a while, I know. Well, it'll, you know, it's the, it's the best two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so, you know, five person uh, group, everyone should have two minutes each. What aspect of your word do you struggle with the most? Yeah. And um, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Enjoy meeting people from across campus. It's see all the rooms are closed um but we're only at 122 so we may have lost a few we may have lost one, okay. yeah. it, it is it is late um so you know we we have a saying um in the ontological phenomenological leadership world which is it's more important what you discover than what i cover okay so the the conversation has been going at a pace that's great for discovery, right? And we wanna keep it that way. Um, me rushing through slides, I promise you is gonna make no difference for you. So, I, so what we're gonna do is we're going to, we're gonna get through one more of the foundational factors, you know, and time permitting, we'll get to the third, but we'll pick it up, we'll pick it up at the next, the, the, the next lab. So, all right. So, wh what did you see? What did you see about where you struggle? What did you notice? What are you confronted by? Right. Who'd like to share? And and know that that you know, it, while it is difficult to jump in on Zoom, you know, you're you're contributing your humanity to other human beings. Right, like we're all like we're all in in this one together, and what you share will contribute to at least one more person. It pretty much works out that way. Um, so, so you know, please do. Oh, good, we have a hand raise. Hey, hi, Katrina. So we had a, a fun group. We were either all were entering the FEMBA or EMBA, and we all we're sharing this, uh, what you know to do struggle, where there's so many balls in the air, so many priorities. How can you 
um, you know, feel good about the work you're doing when you know that, you know, there's so many things that demand your attention and that you can't do everything. And I think that was, um, it was great to sort of see that I'm not alone in that. There's a whole cohort of people I'm joining who share that challenge, um, but it's a real challenge. And um, I think, for, at least for me, when I think of, you know, what was a successful day is did I hit as many of those to do's as I could and give them as much attention as I reasonably could and, and you know in some ways it I feel like it's almost partially willpower do can I sort of get the fortitude to to sit down and um and just focus here just for the five minutes that I need to and go on but um but yeah I think you know just making sure that you know I'm keeping awareness of what's happening and and knowing that you know sometimes they're going to have to tap out and let somebody else know that that can be hard yeah. And, and look, th th it's probably very, very, you know, we all are getting into graduate programs and there's a certain kind of personality <laughs> that, that, that goes with getting into graduate programs. And, and often perfectionism and lots of balls in the air is, is, a part, is a part of that personality. So those things that you know to those items in, in your example, right? You know, oh God, there's this and there's this. Where are those items? Where are they happening? The, I, you're, here you are, you're, you, you're doing whatever you're doing and you know all those things that have to be done. Where, where are those things that have to be done? In my head, in an email. <laughs> and, 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 and even better, if I actually chopped your skull in half and looked in there, it, it wouldn't be in there either, right? <laughs> those, they're not happening. Where you are, those things you have to do are not happening, right? So, but the context that they exist is using you, right? And it impacts your, so one thing you could do is like, well, new content, there aren't all these things there are to, that I have to do. Wow, like there's a whole list of things I get to do next. Huh, oh, they're different, right? So, so that, I, you know, I just wanted you, you, you were illustrating that really beautifully. And so I wanted to, wanted to pull that out. And we, we all get into this mess, those of us, right, that have all these balls in the air. They're actually not. All that's happening is what's happening in front of you right now. Absolutely. Really good. Thanks, Katrina. All right. Who should we go to next? Dylan, you call on folks. I believe Graham had his hand up next, if I saw right. it. Hi, Graham. Hello. Yeah, Hello. this is kind of along the same lines. We also had a really good group and we all, many of us shared very similar things related to um, either what you said you, you would do or what's, what's expected of you. And it's kind of the same with, with having all, all the you know, balls that you're juggling in the air. I, for myself, um, really struggle with what would I say that I'll do. Um, and that's because it's hard for me to say no when it's something that I know I could do and I don't realize the context of, well, they're all, you know, yes, I can agree to A, B, and C right now, but I also have D through Z that I've already agreed to. Um, that's so great, Graham. That's so great. And what else? What else? And it's, it's really great. Insight. And it's humanizing to know that there are other people that go through that as well. Yep. You know, I'm yep. not I'm not the only one. And there, you know, as you recognize that, you there can be almost a like a mutual forgiveness if you if you put context into pe other people's actions. Yeah. Um, the this this what like what I say like what I say I'm going to do and the 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 the, the not say no. Um, it, it is, it, it's, it's so counterintuitive, right? Like, it's like, well, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help these people by saying yes, right? But you're actually reducing workability, right? Um, because you know <laughs> you can't do it. It's actually word next one and two, right? You know you can't do it. What there is to do is to say you can't do it, right? But we... And we'll get into this later. We are all we all are addicted to looking good, right? Because we, if you don't look good as a human being, particularly way back when, you got you 
what happens? What happens if you didn't look good? Somebody shouted out. What would what would happen way back in the days where, you know, we lived in the jungles and you 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 didn't look good to your group? What would happen? Get kicked out of society, stoned, an outcast. Bye bye, and and would likely die. Right, that hardwiring hadn't gone anywhere. I assert. Still, we still want you know because it's almost like death, right? Like if I'm not part of the group, I'm die. Um, so the what you're and the other thing you're pointing to, Graham, is something that happened to me when I started to look at all these 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 aspects of word, which is like, I better watch out what comes out of my mouth. Now. Right. I, I, I better see if I really want to say I'm going to do that thing. And I, for a while, I was very quiet <laughs> um, until I until I sort of got my arms around integrity. So really great, Graham. Thank you. Thank you. Shivani. Shivani. Hey. Um, so I can highlight two that uh, our group talked about that haven't been touched on so far were number three and number five. Um, so number three, in terms of what's expected of you, we just were talking about the difficulty of that one, especially because some of those requests or expectations from whether it's family members or coworkers um, are unwritten. And so, you know, sometimes you don't even know what's expected of you and then somebody gets disappointed. Um, and we were talking about how sometimes um, you know, you knowing that we can't fill everybody's expectations and trying to prioritize, you know, relationships, but then even the people who you love can have unreasonable expectations of you. And so, you know, how to sort of navigate that and, you know, conclusion is basically good communication, but obviously it's complicated. Um, just sort of, yes, yeah, dealing with, with those types of expectations. Um, and then yeah. number five as well um, was what you say you stand for. Um, and that's one that I brought up because I think that, you know, many of us may have big um, lofty values that we like to think that we aspire to or, or follow, whether it's justice or equality or environmentalism. But then if you were to actually take a really hard look at all of your consumer choices and your daily habits and your whatever, are we, are we actually aligned with that? You know, was I willing to, you know, uh, walk the extra 20 minutes to the recycling can instead of the trash can? Was I actually willing to, you know, buy locally for more expensive than, you know, imported? Was I willing to change my diet to do X, Y, and Z? You know, all of these different things. Um, so I think, I, I think an interesting exercise would definitely be to to write down those values and then see are all of my sort of choices actually aligning with that that's, that's, that's brilliant Giovanni and just people are watching you right as this is happening right there are and for those of you that have children your children are watching you as you don't walk to the recycle bin right and it's it it impacts your leadership it impacts your ability to lead them um, because they are observing a, a lack of integrity, right? Now, there's something to do. There is something you can do. We're about to get into that. It's actually not that complicated. Um, there's dissonance in how not complicated it is, uh, but we'll get to it. And you're teeing it up really nice, Shivani. Thank you. All right. Okay, Dylan, we can, I have another hand I can't resist. One more. Can we have one more? Right. This is the Please. last one. Yay, okay. Pooja. So, yeah, we had a fun group too. And uh, one of the, like, the fourth point is something that uh, I struggle with. Many a times uh, we're posed with questions or asked for information. And with how we talked about, like, I don't know, it has still a negative connotation that, you know, you feel like you're not intelligent or stupid. So you come with some kind of number sometimes or some kind of information that in the long run would probably make your brand less attractive and less dependable by others. So um, that's something, it's a daily learning and we still slip on the slippery slope every now and then. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have anything to add. I couldn't have said it any better, right? That, what, what, what do you do, right? And what do we do? All right. So now, now you're, you're, you're present to the mess we get ourselves into. Um, 
with all this word business. And we'll also, there's a reason we're harping on word, okay? That, this an integrity, and we'll get to that toward the end, but there's a reason we're harping on it. Um, okay, so let's now, perhaps a little dissonance. Okay, so yeah, and you can stop there. Integrity, consider, here's a jacket. Integrity is not keeping your word. It's honoring your word. It's honoring that you gave your word or a word, right? Sometimes wholly inappropriate to keep your word. Wholly inappropriate, right? The example I always use is, friend's birthday party, Sunday at four, best friend. Ab absolutely, absolutely, your friend expects you there. You're going, but your family member just got into a car accident, right? It'd be inappropriate for you to keep your word to go to that birthday party, I assert, right? So what do you do, right? How do you honor? How do you honor your word when you can't keep it? So that's, and restoring and integ restoring integrity, right? Once it's out, anything's restorable, right? Um, but if not restored, it just impacts workability going forward. So you gotta restore it. All right, so next, next. So integrity is either, either keeping your word and on time, either keeping your word and on time, or next one, whenever you will not be keeping your word, just as soon as you become aware, ju and just as, the, just as soon as soon you become aware, not after you gambled 30 minutes to see if you were actually gonna be late. You knew 30 minutes ago, it's likely you were gonna be late. Right. The, so when you become aware that you will not be keeping your word, which includes not keeping your word on time, by the way, saying to everyone impacted here, here's here's how integrity gets restored, folks. Simple, not easy. You you say to everyone impacted that you will not be keeping your word You acknowledge I'm hey, buddy, I, I'm not coming. To the to the birthday party, um, and that you will keep that word in the future and by when, or that you won't be keeping that word at all. Right, ship has sailed. And this is the one that folks miss, though, in in the restoration exercise. What you will do to deal with the impact on others of the failure to keep your word or keep it on time, right? It's a three-stepper. Hey, listen, I, I, I'm not gonna make it, right? And I'm not gonna make it, I'm, I'm not gonna make it to your birthday party at four and I'm not gonna make it at all, right? My mom, my mom got in a car accident. She's in the hospital, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go be with her, right? But I know I'm your best friend and I know this was a big birthday. And I know that that you you know like we had we we had plans for the event, right? Um, and you might be disappointed. So when we get through this with with mom, right? Um, let's let's have a let's have a smaller version of the thing that we were going to do at your party, right? And I think that's going. I think the way the doctors are talking, you know. She, we should be good in about a week. So, you know, I'll just circle back with you in a week, one way or the other, okay? There. Again, it's simple. It's not easy to do. Uh, so, if you're gonna be late. Oh, yes, yeah, so we have a hand, Paul. Yeah, I have a quick question. So is there, is there an aspect of consistency with this though? Because you could always just hold the number two and then always immediately backtrack with just about anything. I, I feel like there has to be a, 
a consistency with number one in order for number two to hold true. Just, I, I'm, I'm just curious to see what your thoughts are with that. All right, so do you got to give me a scenario. You got to give, give me a scenario either from, ideally from your life um, or. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, it's funny, in, in, our, in our discussion group, our breakout group, I, I was like, I, in, in my experience with, uh, with work and leadership and, uh, and viewing things, I always can relate it to being a dad and, and with my kids. And so mm -hmm. I think of number two is that whole, I'm going to be home on time with work. If I mm. say, oh, and respond like, hey, I'm not going to be like, all of a sudden, like, they, they don't trust my, my word when I say I'm going to come here. If consistently every single time I'm, I'm calling in saying, hey, I guess I'm going to be late today. Sorry about that. And so I feel like there has to be a consistent consistency with number one in order for two to be able to, to hold ground. It's, so. it's a very interesting thing you're pointing to, Paul. And it's, it's, it's actually counterintuitive when it comes to the world of leadership, turns out, because so you, when let's, let's take, let's, let's take this scenario. Okay. So you're, you, there's an expectation of you, right? Th number three, there's an expectation of you that you're going to be home on time, right? Paul. And what time is that? What is on time? You're asking a, a military pilot. <laughs> Eight o'clock yeah. at night could be, or to, to three in the morning could be on time. <laughs> but right, but what's the expectation? I mean, we're dead in the water. We don't even right, right now because you don't know the expect. What is on time? You can't even be in integrity. Is it five p.m.? Is it six? What is on time? You're so that's what clarify first. What actually is the word you're giving? Mm -hmm really important skill check out check out um before you give your word like check be, be sure you're clear about what you're giving your word to right okay so let's say it's 5 30 p.m right because your day ends at five and it takes half an hour to get home let's just say that for conversational purposes okay so 5 30 you're expected home right so you so you're saying okay so here it is monday you don't here comes 455 you know you're not leaving at five and you know you're not going to be home on time right you're so what you're seeing is if i call on monday and i say hey the 5 30 is not looking looking good i i have another 20 minutes work to do so if i leave in 20 minutes that that gets me home around 5 50. okay you're saying that if you then do that again on tuesday Right. And again on Tuesday, and again on they're not gonna they're not gonna trust you. Absolutely they're not. Yeah, the, then that that was the idea in mind. I'm just thinking of some of the, the individuals that are in, in my teams. If there's a consistency of always doing number two, I'm not gonna have the trust isn't gonna be there for me to know that okay, I can rely on giving an assignment, giving a task to this individual. That they're going to be able to get X, Y, and Z done because consistently they're always backtracking and providing. A, hey, I'm not going to actually be able to keep that word after all, and thus I can't hold true that they're going to be able to do one. Just as in the case of that with the parenting. So. Absolutely, trust and integrity are related. They are not the same thing. Right, right. So you are going to likely trust someone who honors their word, right, more. However, you can, if you called every day at 4.55 and said you weren't going to make it, you are a person of integrity. Are you also a trustworthy person? I don't know. But actually, are you a person of integrity? Yes. Absolutely. And we did sit with it a little bit. It's coming. It's coming. I, I know where you are. Um, it's coming. But yes, counterintuitive. What? Every time? Yeah. Indu, we have, a, we have another hand. Yes. Hi. As 
I just also think that we have uh, something that had to, that have to be added to the component that is trying or making that action, honest action of uh, you know trying to meet what you say that you are uh, going to do. So now when that action is seen of kind of establishing the transparency and the effort that we make, because time and again, you know, I run into kind of the same situation, same situation, similar situation too, uh, in which if we, if we really do not make the uh, priority of putting, okay, this is what I'm going to meet. So what are all the other things that I have to uh, make changes to so I can meet this? There so you go. That, yeah, if that is something which uh, would be the you know uh, catalyst or uh, yeah yeah and and like after a while right like after a while that that will it will add up but the um what do I want to say oh I had it it was there it was there folks it left it'll come back. Whatever, whatever that grade point probably wasn't that important, but I mean, you with this, like you people, you people will look. It is an expectation, right? That you're gonna actually, if you keep doing it, right? There is an expectation that you're going to put something in place so it doesn't keep happening, right? It is an expectation. If you look at it that way, I'd say, yeah, then that that becomes a matter of integrity. Right, because now it's expected of you after five times, like really, like you have the same promise after you didn't keep it five times. Well, that's weird. Yeah, good. Thanks, Indu. All right. Good. All right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. I, I think we went through this one. Uh, ah, you can give me the whole. Give me all of the the bullets, and we'll just go on the last. So. How about sometimes you just don't feel like it. Whereas in the, you didn't make any effort, right? Now, people may not like that, right? But still, if, if it's a matter of integrity, yeah, you're a person of integrity. If you said, you know what, I didn't do it and I didn't feel like it, and I'm never gonna do it. Um, and, I, and I know that, uh, however, here's the, what's that missing? It's missing the impact. Yeah, and I'm never going to do it. And I know that the impact on you is that you likely won't have me as a friend. Right? And, and that's that. I'm willing to deal with that consequence. Right? So and here's the, the, the piece I want you to take away from this slide is honoring your word to yourself is usually the most challenging. Right? Remember, leadership starts with leading yourself. Right? Let's first just have integrity with yourself, right? Remember you said to yourself, I'm gonna go to the gym. I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go three times a week. I'm gonna do cardio for 30 minutes, three times a week, right? And what happens? All right. So that's gonna be the most challenging. See if you can actually like honor your word to yourself. Yeah, good. Okay, so keep going, you can, you can, you can click. Click the first one, Joe. So, right, okay. So for high performance, we've been establishing or to make a big difference, integrity is required. That's what, that was, that's what I've been establishing. Okay, why? Because it sources workability, okay? There's no metal, there's no metal. It just sources workability. There's no integrity metal, okay? It sources workability, okay? So, if it's so fundamental to performance, right? How come you're hearing it from me for the first time, you know, as you're going into grad school, right? Like how come word hasn't gotten around? That, how come just you can turn on the TV and just the lack of integrity can just parade in front of you, right? How come? How come word hasn't gotten around? What, what happens? All right, next slide. Here is why. And this is what, what you have been struggling with as you, as you grapple with this distinction. And those of you that have commented are, are actually struggling with this. You have, I said, there's no metal coming, right? You have integrity collapsed with morality. 
right? Like it's good to be a person of integrity, right? And it's bad and wrong to not be a person of integrity, okay? Consider, jacket, it's neither good nor bad to have integrity. It just is. It's a positive phenomenon, okay? It operates next, next advance. It's kind of like gravity, right? I mean, gra gra you don't like gravity or not like gravity. It's not good or bad, right? It's gravity. But if you don't account for gravity, Dylan, what happens? Splat. <laughs> yes, splat happens. Gravity right? doesn't care how I feel about going to the you, gym. Right. You know, you jump jump out of a plane with, you know, and pretend there's no, you have, ha, pretend there's no gravity, right? Stiff, okay? That's how integrity is. It's just like gravity. It is. But because of this collapse, because of this moral collapse, like I'm good if I have integrity and I'm bad if I don't, we start to go about hiding and concealing our lack of integrity because right, it's a bad thing. We're gonna be a bad person, not a bad person. But that very concealment reduces your capacity to restore it. That, that very concealment reduces our capacity to restore it because now we're just in this weird space of trying to compensate for being a bad person. Yeah. What's, what's next on this? Yep. We can go to the next, right? So, and then the full keep one back, one back, Jill. Yeah. So this, this, the these concealment methods are thematic. I think there's well, there's fourteen now. Um, we keep coming up with more methods of concealment every time we do the course, but they are thematic, right? Like we all, us, us critters, call human beings. Like there is there's a way in which we go about dealing with this. So one of the ways is, well, my word, it's only what I say I'm going to do, right? Like my word, I, I didn't say, I didn't say that, right? So it's not a matter of my word, right? Um, pretty much holding it like that will conf with the, the really establish that you're not a person of integrity. Integrity is always keeping one's word. We talked about that, right? If you hold it like that, you're, you're, you're not gonna be a person of integrity because it's just impossible to always keep your word, right? And this is my favorite, thinking one is a person of integrity will pretty much guarantee that you won't be, right? Integrity, the way we say, it, it's a mountain with no top and you just gotta learn to love the climb, right? It, it just gotta learn to love the climb. Because you know why? The view's better the higher you get. The view's better the higher you get. You know? Yeah. Let's keep going. I'm sorry. What did you mean by word number one? Word number. So it's, your word is only what you said you were going to do, right? So now I'm in integrity because I just ignored those other five. Gotcha. Like they didn't exist, right? Like, no, they still exist. <laughs> Right? You're just pretending that they don't exist for you. You're not a person. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Great question. So it turns out it works like we're the word of, a, of, of an individual, that the mechanism is the same at the organizational level, right? Organizations have words. Remember that mission, my social welfare folks, that, you know, our organization that we work in, we have missions. Uh huh matter of our word. So an organization or any human system is an integrity when, right? It's whole and complete with respect to its word, right? And this includes no deception, no hiding, no untruths, no violation of contracts or property rights, right? Then an organization is integrity, going, right? And it's, you've got a word, an organization has a word it's given internally, right? To its, the members of its organization and it's given a word externally, right? To its stakeholders. Both are a matter of the organization's word. 
keep going. Yeah. And this, this includes what is said on behalf of the organization to its members as well as outsiders. Okay, so oper it operates the same way. If you as an organization are, are operating on a lack of integrity, it is going to impact your performance, right? In the corporate world, the, the, it's, gonna, it's just gonna impact your, bono, your, your margin. And folks have actually sort if when if you hire consultants um, outside of the outside of the academy that charge a gazillion dollars to come consult and use this stuff in your organization, right? You know what they go at first? They go at broken promises and cleaning it up and cleaning it up and cleaning it up, and you see the productivity start to go up. 300, 400, 500 percent. So that's, I mean, I think, um, let's see, keep, let me see, do we want to get to authenticity? Yeah, we'll keep going. We'll get to, so let's, let's talk about the second one. Okay, so the second, being authentic, right? Second foundational factor. What do we mean by being authentic? I'll tell you my definition. Jill's going to put it up in a moment. Okay, my definition, being authentic is being and acting consistent with who you hold yourself out to be for others, which includes who you hold, allow others to hold you to be, and who you hold yourself to be for yourself, right? Acting consistent with who you hold yourself out to be, right? That's what we mean by being authentic. Next. Just like integrity, there is no medal for being authentic, but really, really required to be a leader. It's not good or bad, you wanna lead, authenticity is, is needed. Um, and I, I do see we have a hand raised, um, but we do, let, let me just finish this one slide. So, but we collapse it, we collapse it with morality, and then there goes our ability to be authentic. Right? So it just is. It's not good to be authentic. It's not bad to be authentic. So dear. Hi, Kush. Uh, I have a question. So how do you deal with ambiguity? What's your take on uh, dealing with ambiguity? Say, uh, you know, you're working with a cross-functional team and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other team or, you know, just putting everything aside, like, you know, all the personal stuff aside, you know, they have a different take on, you know, the deliverable and you have a different take on the deliverable where it's not very clear. So, and, and you know, there's, there's challenges and there's difference of opinions. And so how do you deal with that kind of a scenario um, saying that, you know, hey, how do you, how do you look at integrity in that, that sense? So, and you're talking about the, from, from, a, from the authenticity distinction? Right, like, right. I, well, I mean, what might, so let's, what, what would your, your gut say to do? In that situation, without this this conversation, so do you? yeah, most likely I would try to clarify because say if there's no, you know, the way that I look at it is if there's no clear uh, deliverable, you know, I, I would try to clarify it and you know qualitatively put up the deliverable. Yeah, and so then tell me what you were going to say. Tell me. Oh, there you are. So Deer's in this room. He's getting this inkling. We don't know what we're doing here. Nobody's clear. What does Sudhir say? Hey guys, I think this is what we should be doing uh, because of blah, 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 you know, X, Y, Z. And, you know, this is where we are. So, you know, something like that. Close, right? So th that's pretty close to how, how, how I would do. So what, what are you noticing, right? You're noticing that something's not clear, mm -hmm. right? So that's what there is to be authentic about. Hey folks. I, I know we want to get all this done and everybody's really happy and excited to get going, but I have to, I have to be on, like, I have to be honest with you. I think it's, uh, we're unclear. Like, it's unclear what we're doing. I don't think we know what we're doing now. That's just me. Right. And it could be just me. That's unclear, yep. but that's going on for me right now. That's being authentic. Right. Cool. If you go to the, here's what I think we should do. You have stepped over 
the opportunity to be authentic. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Great question. Okay. So let's keep going. Okay. So it's not good, not bad. All right. So there's a lot of words on this slide and we can even make the PDF available. So don't, like, don't, don't worry about like seriously remember everything that's on it. Right. So here's what there is to get. Okay. We, most of us think of ourselves as being authentic, right? Like we just, we, it's, it's me, it's me. It's all, but you just have to get that in certain ways, we are consistently inauthentic. In fact, to be born as a human being is to be inauthentic. We pretend, we pretend, okay? That's the first thing to get. And it's not a bad, you're not, you're just human, right? But because we avoid at all costs confronting this inauthenticity, right? Because we collapse it with morality. Here's the even crazy part. Now we're inauthentic about being inauthentic. Which is, you, you know, like, that's like fooling yourself about fooling yourself, right? That I would say is what is truly foolish, right? So it's like, be, it's like putting frosting on cow dung, right? It's hoping it's gonna go down any better. It's putting authenticity on top of inauthenticity. And you've all experienced this in some way. Like folks, when you're like, you know somebody's BSing you, right? You're not gonna follow them, right? Yeah. Your brain knows, your brain knows. You may not even be able to put your finger on it. Your brain knows somebody's BSing you and guess what? Their brain knows when you're doing it. Okay, so we're all liars, folks. Welcome to the world of humanity. And we had this conversation. We all wanna be admired. We all wanna be seen as loyal, look good. You, and I, I mean, come on, right? I wanna look good for you right now. Right? I want you to think UCLA is great. So we think that inauthenticity is a small price to pay, right? To, 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 be, to be admired and loyal. It's a little, it's a little pretense, right? However, it's just like integrity, right? You start to lose your fingers, right? And it costs us power to be a leader and exercise leadership effectively, especially when you're up to move big mountains, gonna need all that power, right? So if you wanna be a leader, that kind of leader, you're gonna need to have the courage to be straight that when you're, don't pretend that you're right. Don't pretend you know it. Don't pretend you're sophisticated, right? right? You need the courage to be straight about when you're not looking so good. Right. So the here's the counter another counterintuitive point. Okay. Next slide. How do you actually how how do you how, what's the pathway to authenticity? It's actually being authentic about your inauthenticities. Now think back to leaders that you've really appreciated, right? Like they, they're pretty clear. Like, I don't know. Ooh, I just messed that one up. Let me try it again right? They are actually, or folks, like I've been holding it together for you, but I really, I'm scared and I don't know what there is to do. I've been pretending I know what there is to do, but I don't know what there is to do, right? Try it. Try it. Be authentic about your inauthenticity and see what happens. Start in an e uh, a benign area, I, I recommend. Um, like, don't so go straight to the, question, yeah. Can I put you a question here? So yeah, you're talking about uh, you know being authentic about being the inauthenticity, and then there is um, if that tends to happen, like not the first time, not the second time, not the third time, there is a perception, or 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong. There is a perception that oh, okay, what's the point in talking to this guy or this girl? They always be us around, so that person who's actually experiencing it now has some kind of a complexity that's developed saying, okay, I was being honest, mm -hmm. but this is what is happening of me being honest. And it could actually put him back, put him or her back few steps. So my question to you is how do you handle that? Because 
at the end of the day there is a reason why everybody does what they are doing mhm yep right? it could be it, it it depends from person to person but how do we handle that and how do we go back to at a point where we are at the lowest where we are not getting much support for being authentic about being in authentic repeatedly and how do we how do we come back from that because once you're branded it's branded yeah yeah it's a great point so i think i, I think i'm tracking what you're saying so correct me if i'm not sarm the what the inauthenticity isn't the lack of honesty the inauthenticity is pretending you're honest okay right so great look listen i like there's something that i need to tell you i'm mocking there there's something i feel like i should tell you but i'm really really afraid right that if i tell you right you're going to fire me or you're going to hate me and and that's that's not where i'm coming from right but i'm 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 really nervous about about it boom you didn't even say the thing yet it, it's there the you fear, go it's the fear of what could happen if i portray what i am actually truly and once we have that i don't know how we can actually get past the point and be authentic about whatever it is so so you t- so you're not clear like in that scenario mm-hmm. in that scenario tell tell me the part you're still stuck on no no i i'm trying to figure out how do we overcome the branding right when we when oh. somebody looking at us and say okay i know this guy is going to do the same thing again and now you as a person or me as a person i'm thinking i've been honest all this time and people are just rejecting me and going on what's the point of thing i'm just going to keep pretending that i'm no longer that person and say, the, uh, raise your hand and say that hey yeah. y'all I, i've been i've been putting it out there and being vulnerable right you know right or wrong clumsily or not clumsily however right like what my experience is all this rejection when i do it and so like i'm really starting to feel pulled to start to hide it all again and not be clear with you about what's really going on for me that's the authentic part it's okay. literally being clear about that thing your brain is saying <laughs> okay yeah okay. yeah garrett and then we'll 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 do garrett's question and then we'll i think we'll do the breakout send them maybe they'll we'll send them off into breakout homework all at the same time all right sounds, sounds good garrett Yeah so um I I guess it's kind of a question maybe a comment is um you say you know it's what's it's not necessarily good right it's indifferent in a sense right but maybe speak to neutral 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 sure so in terms of morality so piety right it's mm-hmm. it's different than that but that's not to say that it's not preferable right i think it'd be preferable if you had these things but not necessarily moral um and then also attainable versus an aspiration right so mm-hmm. again if Rounded everybody pursued these things yeah if everybody pursued them acknowledged that they weren't necessarily attaining them that would be a good thing right? you can have these things and pursue them not attain them and be a preferred person but not necessarily a moral person you can be a, an oddball that does really good things in the world inconsistently that maybe isn't doesn't have integrity or isn't you know doesn't have whatever this that and the other but you can be what everybody would agree is a good person right you're you know you sacrifice certain right. things but sure so um absolutely you can be a good person and be not a person of integrity so oh, i guess yeah. my point or clarifying point is you say not good but make sure that i understand that you would everybody would probably agree that it's preferable would, not moral but preferable preferable because it creates workability sure that's it Yeah, but so keep going. Sorry, Gary, I just wanted to No, that's it. I mean, okay. just making sure you agree with that point. That's how I'm understanding do. it. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, because we would all prefer workability, right? We want right. we all want the thing, right? Yes. I mean, and that's kind of There's like nobody stuff. that we would probably say shouldn't pursue that thing as an aspiration, but you're right. not unless good or like bad because you do it. Right? Like unless there's a mental health challenge, sure, yeah. right? Like yeah. Yep. But even then if you aspire to it that i mean that doesn't mean you might attain the same 
No, what I'm saying is like that, 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 that to not want workability, to not want something to work deliberately, right? I, you, like, w- w- you know, there's, there's got to be something off that, that you would seek. Oh, so you're saying those people may not be the ones that prefer it. You're saying, I get you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, I can't That's think all. of a scenario, but theoretically, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Great question, Garrett. Thank you. And for all of you that, that very courageously in a room of a hundred people raised your hand and said something to lots of small rectangles, I appreciate it. I know what it takes. So um, Dylan, here's what I think we should do. Let's, let's do the, let's show the next slide. Okay. And I want you to pretend that this breakout that you're going to have is out there in life. Right. This is a this is a practice breakout out in life. Okay. And so do this, do this, do this between now, right? And we'll check in on it. We'll do some, we'll do some sharing about it the the next lap. Okay. So here's what we want you to do. Um, like, like pick a person. Well, you can do this with yourself, right? You can do this with yourself in a pen and paper. Bonus round, do it with a person. That's a, that's the bonus, right? Name one area where you're being inconsistent with how you hold yourself out to be, right? One area, okay, for others. And another area where you're acting inconsistent with who you hold yourself out to be for yourself, okay? So you're gonna be naming two areas, right? Adequate, if you do it with yourself, bonus, if you actually tell somebody, uh, a human being, does it not kind of count with your cat? Uh, And then, share where you could bring authenticity to it, particularly with regard to your grad school preparation, right? Like with regard to, so name an area where you're inconsistent with others, name an area where you're inconsistent with yourself, and then inquire into like, well, where am I being inauthentic here with this grad school stuff? And where could I bring authenticity to it? Oh, oh yeah, I'm acting like I've got it all together. I'm scared like to pieces. Right? And I need help. And I'm not telling anybody. Oh, maybe you could go get some help. Yeah. So that's what there is to do. So take a picture of it and we'll check in on it next time. All right, Dylan, bring us home. All right. Well, um, so we're, we're three minutes over. So should we, we should wrap up? Okay. We so, should wrap thank- up. so let's, let's go to our last few slides. Just to get folks like the information they need. Yep, here's the next session. So our next session is two weeks from tonight, June 30th, same time, new and different link. And the slide after that. Uh, so this, yeah, go ahead, Dylan. No, no, please. Uh, so this is just a, so Dylan mentioned this is part of a full course and that full course actually happens in the summer. Um, it's a summer session course, so actually students take it and folks from the public take it. Um, and registration is open now. Uh, it's a six unit course, so it would actually count um, uh, you know, for a leadership elective or something like that if you had one in your program. Uh, and we just wanna, want you to know that that's available to you, right? Um, it's not for everyone, right? Um, but, you know, it, it, and it's intense and there's some rigorous self-reflection but we do promise that you will leave, and we promise this, you will leave being a leader and exercising leadership effectively as your natural self-expression. I just gave you my word. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and the reason I'm even getting to work with Kush is I took her, I audited her class in social welfare in winter of 2016, and it rocked my world. I wrote a book, launched a podcast, um, and I've gotten up at 5 a.m. every day for the last five years. It really got me in the frame of leading myself. So for all my FEMBA students, uh, we're going to offer this this summer and next summer. And yeah, I'd love for you guys to take it because I think integrity and management just go hand in hand has been my experience. So just my little appreciation of, of the power of the course. It really transformed the middle of my career. It's just made going to work so much more fun. So I think that's it. I think we are complete. Thank you for the extra five minutes. Thanks for the rich conversation and engagement Thank tonight. Thank you very much. Dr. Cooper, Dr. Kush Cooper, my sister from another mister. 
Um, you're donating your time with us. Uh, you're, you're giving us the chance to have the best fall quarter ever and really, you know, come into UCLA at 100 miles an hour and, and have the best academic launch that we possibly can. So thanks for the thanks in the chat, everyone. Thanks for the really um, wonderful engagement. And we will see you in two weeks, two weeks from tonight. See you then. Go forth and lead. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Dylan, I'm going to jump because I.